Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I miss church. How could you miss church, pastor? You are standing in one even as you preach. And as most of you know, the answer to that question is church is not the building. Oh, how all of us have been reminded of that in profound ways in these past weeks. If I had known on March the 8th that the last time I gathered with the part of the body of Christ that gathers at Faith Lutheran Church in Lebanon, Tennessee, that I would possibly not see them for 12 weeks, the handshakes and hugs and how-do-you-do's would have been oh so fervent. The emptiness of this room only heightens the sense of aloneness and separation from the people I am called to serve. I am sure many of you are experiencing the same feelings. I miss church. Today's gospel from John 14 is a very important word to the church. In my New Revised Standard Version translation, this section is headed the promise of the Spirit. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. One of my favorite commentaries is the People's New Testament Commentary by Eugene Boring and Fred Craddock. They write about this passage from John and who Jesus is addressing. As in Acts chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians 12, the expression refers primarily to the presence of God's Spirit in the community. Individuals participate in the life of the Spirit, not on an individualistic basis, but by belonging to the community of faith, animated and guided by God's Spirit. The pronouns and verb forms are in the plural throughout. So the 14 yous in just seven verses of today's gospel passage are referring to the community, the church. This gift of the Holy Spirit is a gift to the church a gift to all of us together. A second thing to note about this passage of Jesus promising the Spirit is how it happens in the midst of Jesus describing the interconnectedness between the community keeping his commandments and loving him. Loving Jesus and keeping his commandments go hand in hand. But more important is that this whole passage is not just set in a speech laced with lots of love language. This is that foot washing scene. It is in that same room where Jesus has given his disciples, including one who is about to betray him and one who will deny him and all who will abandon him, a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, all of you who will do these hurtful things to me in the next few hours, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This promise of the Spirit is set in a scene of love in action. Jesus has taken the role of a house slave and has reversed the order of hierarchy and privilege. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus tells his disciples and us just a very few verses before today's gospel reading. The Greek word paraclete that gets translated in the NRSV as advocate, means the one who is called alongside. Jesus promises to send one to us, to the church, to accompany us in the mission of God to which Christ's church is summoned. 
We are not summoned by God to sit on the gift of the Spirit that God has given us. We are not summoned by God to just wait until Jesus returns and watch over and guard the Spirit in our buildings. I was on a Zoom call just this week with pastors from the community where I serve, a couple dozen of us. The local Chamber of Commerce had thought it would be a good idea for us to share our experiences with adjusting to not being able to gather, as well as maybe our plans for starting back. There was cordial conversation and some updates on the work in our community to respond to the March 3rd tornadoes that ripped through Middle Tennessee with our town being in the direct path. One of the pastors of a pretty large non-denominational church made a comment on the good work our community churches were doing together. Jesus Christ died to make this church. Perhaps because us Lutherans and other denominations that observe the liturgical year are still in the week of weeks, those seven Sundays of the Easter season, I immediately thought, no, pastor, Jesus did not die to make this church. Jesus rose from the grave to make this church. Jesus defeated death once and for all to give life to this church. We are an Easter people because we are resurrection people. As the Reverend Dr. Anna Madsen reminds us in her book, I Can Do No Other, we are Christians called, therefore, to be ambassadors of Christ and of all that his resurrection confirmed, healing, feeding, serving, welcoming, teaching, and forgiving. In other words, that advocate that is our gift accompanies us when we push back against death and circumstances and systems that oppress and are not life-giving and imprison those who God created in love in God's image. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love God. Love your enemies, love your neighbor, love one another. In the same way Jesus has reversed the order of hierarchy and privilege when he took on the role of a servant, our church is called to do that in this very day and time. For too long we have at best turned a blind eye to and at worst participated in systems that oppress and cause suffering to our neighbor. At the 2019 churchwide assembly where I participated as a voting member, our church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, took steps to repent and at least begin the conversation to address the issue of racism in America. I witnessed our church's public apology titled Declaration of the ELCA to People of African Descent, which acknowledged that racism and white supremacy are deeply rooted in our nation's history of slavery and that the church has been complicit. We adopted a resolution condemning white supremacy and we adopted a resolution to establish June 17th as Emmanuel 9, Day of Repentance, to remember those killed in Mother Emmanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina. I was proud of our church for pushing back against death in those forms for those children of God who have lived and suffered under those systems for centuries. But today our church has an opportunity to claim the presence and the accompaniment of the Advocate that Jesus promised and that his resurrection delivered to us, not in a collective statement of repentance, but in a collective action of love. A little over a week ago, people all over our country were stunned to learn of the murder of Ahmad Arbery 
who was murdered in Brunswick, Georgia, by two white men while jogging. Our Southeastern Synod Bishop, Kevin Strickland, has issued a pastoral message in which he reminds us there is never anyone whose face we look into that we do not see the very face of God. We are gifted and entrusted with the spirit of truth. And this is a time for the church to speak truth to power, to speak on behalf of those who have no voice and on behalf of those whose voices are not listened to when they speak. Speaking out in an action of love is our chance to remind all Christians that faces of God come in widely varied and diverse representations, but that God sees all of them and each of us in God's image. And that paraclete, that advocate, is sent to collect all of us into relationship with our Creator and our Redeemer. I invite you, especially in this season of resurrection celebration, to be in prayer and be in action, to love your neighbor, to love each other, to love God who loves you mightily. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.